It is a pleasure to be here and to have an opportunity to open this, um, this conference and to reflect on um, some of the themes that um, I think will be explored over the next couple of days. Um, I'm going to give you a couple of perspectives at a pretty high level, but um, I'm hopeful that you will see parts of this echoing through the discussions um, uh, as they continue in the conference. Um, I also just want to take a brief moment to apologize in advance. Um, because of some scheduling issues, uh, I'm going to have to take off pretty promptly after um, my talk. So um, I won't necessarily um, have the opportunities that I'd like to uh, be able to chat with all of you, perhaps. Um, we can pursue some of those over email or something in future. So let me get on to um, my, main, um, my main two themes here. Uh, clouds, of course, have been um, all the rage in the press and everywhere else for about three years now, three, four years. Um, it's getting to the point where um, you would be wise to cross-examine anyone who makes reference to the cloud fairly carefully because it means totally different things to different people. Um, it has some fairly precise technical meanings, although they range quite broadly. Um, you see storage clouds, uh, which are um, in fairly widespread deployment now, um, although um, even there, I think the, um, the hype about them perhaps outruns the reality. You see um, compute and compute on demand clouds. Uh, those are, again, relatively commonplace, um, although they tend to find their way into sort of niche markets sometimes. Uh, I mean, one of the things that's wonderful about the world of compute clouds, for example, is that you don't have to spend a lot of money up front. So if you're planning to do an internet startup and um, you don't happen to have the money to make down payments on huge amounts of servers for the great success that you're expecting the week after you make the service public, you can pay a premium and um, in the long run, but make it someone else's problem in the short run. Um, and we've certainly seen that model of um, doing business startups take off with an absolute vengeance. Uh, we also um, are seeing more recently um, the notion of clouds as environments for doing work. You know, th this started um, probably most heavily in the consumer marketplace where you think of Google and its assorted services um, as sort of out there in the cloud. You think of something like Facebook as this cloud-based service. And as you look at these different services, they increasingly have tendrils everywhere. Some of them are visible, you know, you. Uh, um, will buy something someplace and it will immediately uh, offer you a button to post that on Facebook. Um, in other cases, um, it actually is much more subterranean with various brokerage services handing off cookies and other tracking implements uh, between sites to pass around records of what you're up to. Um, here, of course, in, in this, this latter scenario, um, the technical definitions go out the window. Really, what you're seeing here is a, tech, a, a, a view that says most of what you're doing has come off of your desktop. It has come off of machines you control. And actually, a lot of the locus of control of your destiny has moved out of your hands. Um, in very recent times, um, you may have seen within the last few months, um, first the offering of uh, Office 360 from Microsoft, which basically um, moves away from um, a desktop-centric thing to a very attractively priced network provision of these kinds of application services. I mean, Google, in a very real sense, was already there. But what's striking is that in the case of Microsoft, it's not a 
greenfield service like google but rather a deliberate view that they are moving away from or at least um, starting to move away from a very profitable franchise that's built on local software into something that's web-based. And then most recently, and um, really the most aggressively um, framed one that I've seen at scale is what Adobe's done, where basically they've said, they're not going to sell you software anymore. Those days are over. Your only option is to rent it. Now, contrast that to Microsoft's position, which is, we'll be happy to take your money if you want to buy it. Um, we'll give you a better deal, at least for the moment, if you want to rent it, because we're trying to drive business that way. But, you know, we're going we're gonna to go both ways. Adobe took a very, very aggressive um, stance and basically said, we are moving to this environment. Um, and that, as we will come back to and see shortly, has some really scary implications um, when we start talking about how all of this business intertwines with the um, creation, the character, the management, and the access to the broad cultural record. So I'm going to cover two sets of issues tonight. One is around the nature of the cultural record itself and how some of these developments um, in um, cloud computing with particular emphasis, frankly, on, um, on uh, per the, the sort of personal realm as opposed to the large scale commercial realm, um, how the nature of that record is changing. The other thing I'm going to talk about is how the ways in which we manage and provide access to the record, both the record we've already accumulated over um, centuries and centuries of um, human activities, and the record going forward, how the nature of how we manage and offer access to that changes because of the cloud. And I think we'll see some interesting things there. Um, I want to stress that um, even when we're talking about technical clouds, there are many of these. And do not make the mistake of thinking they play particularly nicely with each other. Um, they are all a bit different. It is quite a pain, in, all, in many cases, quite a substantial and expensive and time-consuming um, technical enterprise to migrate something from one cloud to another. Furthermore, particularly when you think about applications as many of us in the world of scientific or scholarly data curation, libraries, management of cultural materials think about, when you think about those sorts of things, bandwidth is a big issue. You can have these wonderful clouds, but if it takes you six months to get your data in and another six months to get it out because you're constrained by some limited bandwidth thing, or you discover that the, the cost of bandwidth in and out is very expensive and hence the switching costs from one cloud to another are very high, um, you suddenly realize that this sort of world of um, computational utility um, uh, that we've been dreaming about since the 1960s and um, you know now in some ways can see manifest in the cloud, you discover this isn't a genuine sort of substitutable utility. This is actually a place with lots of barriers and lots of lock-ins um, uh, and many of them revolve around the availability of bandwidth. You need to look very carefully at how things are interconnected. So, for instance, um, you see a number of commercial players around Amazon, for example, Microsoft Azure, offering um, uh, compute on demand kind of services. You'd think these would be of great interest to people who needed extra peak load cycles for some reason, um, who are doing high end scientific computing. Well, they are of some interest, but for the first couple of years, you really didn't have good direct connectivity at high speeds between the research backbones, 
that are carrying data and access to supercomputing in all of the various nations that do that kind of work. You didn't have the direct connections and peering between that and these commercial clouds. That's only really gone into place in the last year um, and now is starting to reconfigure the landscape. Um, another place, um, and we'll come back to this, I think, um, uh, a little later as well, is thinking about the mismatch between the bandwidth available to an individual, what you can get at home from um, DSL, from cable broadband, from fiber, if you're lucky enough to have it, um, the mismatch between the kind of data rates you can get there and the kind of activities that take place inside the cloud. Um, what it means, among other things, is that you cannot casually say, I'm going to do a really big data extract from something and move it down to my desktop and deal with it. You can't do that, not because your desktop isn't big enough, but because in many countries, the policies that surround the deployment of consumer broadband have left us in situations where that broadband is really pretty limited and it's probably not going to get a lot better real soon. That is unquestionably the case in much of the United States right now, and while there are some sort of wild cards in the deck, like Google's threat to go out and wire you know, every home in a couple of select cities with, um, with direct fiber, um, it looks you know, pretty grim for the next few years for most people. Um, so th these, these are things that shape the whole cloud experience. Now, let me, let me start by talking a bit about how clouds change the management of the record. Um, and then we'll move on to what it's doing to the record itself for the remainder of our time. So one of the things we're seeing is the notion that there has always been implied in the idea of access to digital information, access to a certain amount of computational power that is provided to make that access to the content happen. Now, you know, historically, um, when we thought about doing things like reading journal articles online, reading a newspaper online, um, reading a book online, things took place at human speed, at the speed of eyes, at the speed of, um, you know, of, of a human reader flipping pages or doing the analog of that in a digital environment. The actual amount of computation you had to back these things up with per user was pretty small. And we were, of course, happily riding the curve of Moore's Law, computing getting cheaper every year. The notion of being able to bring up websites that would support you know, incomprehensively vast numbers of concurrent readers um, was pretty manageable. I mean, yes, there was cost associated with it. There was engineering associated with it. But the sort of, um, uh, you know, cost per eyeball was a tractable kind of thing. You could, you could write it off in advertising if you were a commercial entity. You could write it off in operating costs if you were a government entity. Um, you're seeing, um, you know, around the world, I think, certainly in the United States, a, a vast amount of um, government emphasis on opening up access to government information, whether it's textual or numeric or imagery or whatever. Um, and also opening up access to both writings and um, underlying data that are the result of government funded research. This is the whole open access movement. And um, really, it's kind of a double barreled thing. Um, a lot of the focus inside academia in the last few years has been around journal publishing and what this means for journal publishing and around the sharing of research data. But for example, in the United States, with surprisingly little press coverage um, in May, you saw an executive order um, from the president 
basically telling all of the executive branch agencies in the United States that they should be planning going forward for making all of their data publicly available unless there was some good reason not to, confidentiality and privacy, security, something like that. But the default action would be they should be designing systems that open this stuff up to the public. Now, what's starting to happen is that we're starting to see these human readers who flip pages and aren't very computationally intensive getting joined by a menagerie of computer programs that want to do text mining and data mining and cross comparison and indexing and all kinds of fascinating stuff, some of which we understand and some of which we don't understand. And these software instruments are showing up and wanting access to large collections of data. They are joining human readers in looking through large collections of text. So all of a sudden, we are starting to see these ideas about open access taking on this problematic dimension of computational provisioning. It's no longer enough to say, well, I need enough disk space to house the data I'm obligated to provide access to, and then I need some relatively light computing capability to let human beings page through it. Now, all of a sudden, to really use this stuff meaningfully, you need to be able to back it up somehow with a lot of computation. Many areas are just getting too big for humans to deal with. If you look at the statistics for publishing in the life sciences, for example, articles, you see numbers like, you know, there's an article every three minutes, maybe. Nobody is going to keep up with the literature that's growing in an article every three minutes. And I don't even want to talk about the, you know, mismatch between upload and view rates on something like YouTube. They upload, you know, six hours per second or something like that. I mean, these are numbers that basically say that without a lot of computational help, you really can't keep very good track of what's in there. And therefore, people get narrower and narrower and more and more siloed. Consider the problem of the historian of the 21st century. Say they're trying to write a history of, I don't know, one of our recent presidents in the United States. The issue there is not can they get access to material. The issue there is that there is more material there than they can read in five lifetimes. And somehow they need a lot of computational help to plow through it. Imagine the special collections of the 21st century in libraries, right? You used to get a few cartons of the papers of somebody. And most people, I'll make some broad generalities here, were terrific pack rats. They threw out a lot of stuff before they got there. Imagine being on the receiving end of 35 years of collected email from some public figure, where now that is the primary papers or a big piece of it for that public figure. The issue there, again, is going to be there's no way human beings are going to plow through all of that. It's going to be historians and biographers and political scientists and people like that partnered with computational tools that need platforms to run on and that need cycles to do what they need to do. Very, very interesting situation. I would just note parenthetically that there are also problems on the territorial side here. One of the big ones is redaction. When 
the size of the record was pretty small. You could find enough human beings to go through and redact indiscreet things and pull stuff that should stay private. Um, now you have uh, just unmanageable problem when you start talking about things like government records, um, figuring out how can you let people compute on them and then select a few things which a human might go through and appraise and redact if necessary before giving them to the scholar? Can you let that computation happen safely without too much leaking out to cause trouble? Um, these, these are strange and wonderful new areas of research that are emerging here as we struggle in this environment. So, Let's return to this business of access implying computation. We are now moving into an environment where more and more kinds of access actually require um, meaningful amounts of computation. And we have some hard questions here. One is, where does the computation happen? Um, who provides the tools? Who sets the limits on what you can do? Um, I just invite you to, you know, sort of think through some of these scenarios in your head, um, and and let's just talk through a few. So, the idea of open access to a journal. Well, one way to think about that is it means humans can read it, right? So you can go over to the journal's website, and it'll let you page through it and read it, and maybe even print it. Uh, very different than saying, I'd like to download most of the literature of mathematics onto a couple of hard drives on my desktop and do a computation on them, except that since you won't let me do that, and I don't have the bandwidth anyway, even if I do have the storage, um, I need to compute over in your space. Well, um, how many sites do you know who say, fine, send me your programs. I'm happy to run them and see what they do on my site. Um, what fun. Uh, no, what they'll do is they will um, sandbox you into some kind of virtual machine environment that is very carefully constrained and isolated. Um, there's a debate that's sort of simmering about are we going to basically, for most practical purposes, have the tools of text mining defined by the publishing community? Because you will need to run those tools in their environments. They will only let you run tools or um, will charge you extra if you want to run other tools that are computationally intensive. So they may only let you run things that are fairly inexpensive computationally. Um, and they'll probably offer you a rather high level interface to it where they're packaging in many of the algorithms. You can play that over not just in publishers, but in all kinds of cultural um, memory organizations. The Library of Congress got some publicity about a year ago, a um, year and a half ago, I guess now, when um, it was announced that they were going to get the Twitter archive. So they've now got these wonderful data feeds coming in from Twitter. Housing them on disk is not a problem. If you talk to the people there, the thing that has them pounding their heads against the wall um, as they try and struggle with how on earth could we provide access to this is computational provisioning for these resources. It's where do we get the supercomputer form to deal with the kind of queries that people are going to want to run across this database, which are not simply, you know, show me tweet 1,992,000, blah, 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 you know, and it pops up 140 characters. They're going to be asking questions about the nature of the connectivity graphs and things like that, stuff that is really genuinely expensive to compute. So, back to our friends, the clouds. Can we do some of this computation in the clouds? Can we imagine an environment where if you really want to dig into the treasures of a poorly funded um, cultural heritage organization, 
or maybe not even poorly funded, but just one without infinite resources. The deal is you buy some computing cycles in a part of the same cloud that they're in so that the data transfer stuff is manageable within that cloud. You certainly, in most cases, if it's a big collection of data, can't download it yourself because the consumer broadband isn't capable of handling this. There are some other interesting variations one can imagine here. Um, in some parts of the United States now, and I think in a few other countries as well, we're asking questions about the role of libraries, and particularly public libraries in society going forward. We're also asking questions about how much bandwidth should a public library have, and what would they do with it? Um, there are at least a few experiments that are starting to run where they're putting in gigabit and upwards connectivity into public libraries. One can imagine public libraries serving as a safety net for a failed consumer broadband policy, at least in some locales. Um, and at the same time also providing some help to people who need um, assistance in doing this kind of analysis of cultural memory content. A very interesting and unexpected set of developments. Um, another one that I'll point up is um, just very explicitly, and I touched on it before, is this question about the mobility of computation. Um, the idea of can you send your queries or computations to the data rather than pulling the data to where you've got computational control. This is an issue that has a very, very rich history. It has a history that reaches into the construction of query languages, into distributed computing, um, into the design of distributed computing protocols, and the allocation of function between client and server. Um, if you look at many of the ideas that motivated the development of things like Java, um, there again this idea of protected computing environments where one could safely deliver computation to a data environment. Um, go back all the way to um, the early 1980s, and yes, it was that long ago when um, Bob Kahn and Vint Cerf, um, names you'll recognize from the uh, development of the internet, actually um, devised a, a, a vision of what they called NOBOTS, K-N-O-W-B-O-T-S, which again were a way of packaging computation and moving it to, moving it to data. All of these things now are resurfacing in very interesting new ways in the cloud environment. So that's about all I want to say about management and access to the record. Clearly, there are lots and lots of details here. The details are really interesting. Um, they are really complicated and really situational. Um, one of the great challenges, I think, is going to be coming up with better tools to make more and more of the user community able to do computational things with literature and data. And we're seeing a huge amount of work in that area right now. Look at um, the uh, impact of something as simple as the Google Ngram viewer, where you now have a whole line of research that basically says, I'd like to look at a century and a half of text and look at how the usage of certain phrases came and went across that century and a half, and in what kind of books, and in what kind of contexts. Um, you're starting to see that sort of thing. Um, a lot of the developments in digital humanities are about, can we get better tools for this? Um, and get them to a stage when humanists don't have to also be computer scientists, but can just collaborate with them. I'll give you one other example, um, which I think really illustrates how much progress has been made. Cast your mind back, um, if you've been around that long, um, to, let's say, 1990. 
and to the wonderful emerging world uh, in the early 1990s of so-called GIS, Geographical Information Systems. Uh, you will remember some very expensive proprietary tools. You will remember that many research libraries had this one specialized person, the GIS librarian, who worked with these geospatial data sets and these very complicated tools and would work one-on-one -on -one with um, PhD students who needed to weave them into the work they were doing. Compare that to Google Maps, Google Earth, and um, similar products from other competitors. Uh, those things actually, uh, we, we really, we have forgotten quickly how huge a gap those have spanned um, between geospatial data being a very specialized preserve of a few people and kind of basic functions being accessible to a very significant amount of the um, interested people out in the world. Let's turn in our last 20 minutes or so to this question of what's happening to the nature of the cultural record. And I will simply stipulate that the cultural record is a very big and diverse and messy thing. We could spend a lot of time that we don't have tonight uh, delineating its boundaries and looking at where new growth is taking place. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about, uh, in fact hardly at all, about the sort of commercial side of this about how we save books and movies and sound recordings and photographs and images that find their way into the consumer marketplace um, and the various instrumentalities that we have around that consumer marketplace to ensure that those things get saved. There are a lot of issues that are showing up there as well, um, but Instead, I want to focus on the individual, the consumer, if you will, and to recognize that a great deal of the cultural history that we have out there really isn't published. It really wasn't developed for money. It was done by some individual because they were sharing their thoughts with someone else. Um, they were writing letters, they were capturing experience, they were making art, not necessarily for the purposes of commerce, but just for the love of the making of art. All kinds of motivations. And that's come down to us in our archives, in our library collections, especially our special collections. If you look at great research libraries, you know, much of the core uniqueness and distinctiveness of their individual collections are their holdings of personal and in some cases institutional materials that were never published. That's what makes them such rich resources for research. What happens to all of that stuff as it gets scattered across the cloud? I would suggest that already we are seeing most people moving very quickly away from the notion that they have their stuff and instead of it being in shoe boxes and cartons, it's on hard drives on their desk, to their stuff is scattered around the net, around the clouds. Much of it is in the custody of commercial services where you may or may not be able to get it out where the commercial services may or may not give you a lot of notice if they decide to go out of business or simply become bored with managing your stuff. Um, we have interesting examples of both of those kinds of phenomena happening. What we really have seen take place here, I would say, is something that is beyond technical. It's really a whole kind of a restructuring of the relationship between human beings and the things they create and record and share, where a lot more of that has been pushed out into 
hard to define kind of places on the network um, where the obligations for stewardship are unclear um, at best, um, sometimes actively off the table. And it's not just, um, you know, things that people are putting on social media. It's calendars and mail and um, all, all kinds of um, pieces of daily life. Those have all moved away. They've moved out there. Just think of the note. If you really want to capture this as graphically as possible and, and understand how deep this shift is, think of the notion of personal effects. It used to be somebody died and somebody, some member of their family or the executor of their will or someone would come and sort out their personal effects, which were mostly physical things. Some of them were bought things, you know, they might be books. Um, many of them might be family photos. They might be, you know, the electric bills that um, strange people, you know, file for 35 years, month after month, um, just because they get them and they file them. Um, but there was this sort of notion of physical, you know, of personal effects that were physical. Now you start looking at situations where when people die, um, we move into this enormous, ambiguous kind of legally gray area, um, procedurally gray area where um, simply getting an inventory is almost impossible. You know, do you know all the accounts that um, people you're close to have on all of those systems out there? Do you know the passwords? Um, do you know what the policies of those various organizations are um, in terms of uh, you show up and say, I'm the heir of so-and-so and I'd like access to their account. Um, there have been some really, um, really heartbreaking cases here where um, you've seen, for example, um, young kids uh, go off to war. They don't come back. And their parents want to ensure that, you know, their Facebook page or whatever is saved and sorting out the right relationships and, and arrangements and access um, has proved to be very complicated. Um, and uh, this is an area also where there is um, tremendous variability from nation to nation. Um, the, the law on this is anything but settled. But that just illustrates the, the level of, of fragility we've come to. Um, and the extent to which all of the personal information that people have has migrated out into these various clouds um, uh, that are now an integral part of the fabric of this cultural um, record. I want to close by spending a couple of minutes here, and we should have time maybe for a question or two, um, with a few comments about the recent move of software to the um, to the cloud, the Photoshop and um, Creative Suite stuff that Adobe's done, the um, the Microsoft Office, um, even the idea that you're starting to see now of um, uh, systems that are sort of self-updating all the time. If you really step back and you look at many of the issues around the longevity of digital information and our ability to manage it. One of, one of the things that's at the heart of our ability to handle this is being able to pace revisions and software to the management of data. So, for example, um, if I have a huge corpus of documents that were written in, um, you know, Weird Write, which stopped being produced in 1995, and that, by the way, won't run under the last four versions of Apple's operating system because it was designed for the PowerPC or something, um, 
you don't want suddenly to lose all that infrastructure. You will lose the content. Um, standards are a certain amount of bulwark against this because um, at least on a good day, sometimes you can get software vendors to adhere to standards and give you some warning when they're going to stop supporting them. You often have a broader choice of tools if it's a well-established market standard. But standards are sometimes they're there when you want them. Sometimes they aren't. Sometimes the adoption rates are high. Other times, the, in other areas, the adoption rates are smaller. Um, so this sets up a very, very dangerous situation. Imagine a couple of years from now that we've moved into these cloud software environments. I don't own any software anymore. Indeed, what I'm doing is I'm paying a subscription for it. Now, there are a couple of bad things that happen here. One, of course, is that uh, if I hit some financial reversals, I can't use my content anymore because I can no longer afford to pay the rent on the tool to use it. But that, that's, that's a problem, but not necessarily a structural sort of problem from a preservation point of view. Here's the structural problem. You connect up and your updates start applying. And when all your updates are finished, you discover that the latest and greatest version of whatever this is doesn't support some of your old formats. And now, all of a sudden, you have a collection of orphaned content. You can't do any of the things that we do today when that happens. You can't say, well, I think maybe I'm not going to go with that update, and I'll you know, go to my backup, and I'll run last year's version for a couple of years while I figure out what to do with the material that would otherwise be orphaned. You can't go on eBay looking for an old version of the software, because the old version of the software disappeared into the vaults of the software cloud provider and is never going to be seen again. Basically, what the software clouds raise the specter of is having the migration, uh, the uh, having the pacing of the ability to read old formats move entirely at the mer to the mercy of the software suppliers, who frankly could care less about this and often have very bad histories in this area. Um, some of them won't even warn you today when they ship a new thing that, by the way, it will break everything from you know, three releases back. You find that out from the user groups after it's been out for a few days. Um, it's not part of the spec. Um, I, I think that how we operate in this world is an enormous challenge. Um, it is, you know, it has a little bit of an echo of some of these stories that have been going around recently about um, electronic book, book readers going wild and deciding that you're in a country where this material isn't licensed, so it's just going to erase your library. Or, of course, the classic but true story from a few years ago of um, Amazon deciding that the version of Orwell's 1984 that they had been making available was in fact covered by copyright and needed to be disappeared from all the Kindles in the field. That actually did happen. Um, of course, you know, the fact they picked that book is just mind-boggling. But. Um, uh, this, this, is a, this is actually a true story. Um, we, we really begin to see, I think, here the potential as not just content, but software becomes much more deeply implicated in this cloud setting of some very problematic unintended consequences for our ability as individuals to preserve material and consequently for that material to find its way into the more formal and more protected um, cultural record across time. 
So I hope I've given you, you know, a couple of kind of broad things to look at here. Um, one is the involvement of computation increasingly in access to content. Um, and I think there is no question that we are moving into a political environment, into a um, set of scholarly norms that place a great deal more emphasis on access to data, access to writing, access to primary source material um, that's in various hands. And that access increasingly includes computation. And we don't have good strategies yet for how we're going to fund that, how we're going to manage it, and where we are going to situate that computation between the stewards of content and the people who need to use that content. Similarly, I hope I've given you at least some things to think about in terms of the relationship between the individuals' um, accumulation of memories and observations and creation, um, <coughs> excuse me, and the world of commercial services and social media that are spread across the cloud. I also hope I've at least given you something to think about as you grapple with the emerging idea of software as a service that is cloud-based, that moves to the cloud, and that as a consequence of that move to the cloud, um, really starts to take individuals out of the control of the character and change and evolution of that software um, in a much more powerful way than has been the case in the past. I thank you for sharing this tour with me, um, and uh, I would be very happy to take maybe a question if we have time. Um, I think we're okay on schedule. Yes. I have this program right mm -hmm. It's completely it's a cloud based Precisely. So, uh, one of the things we were talking about was this issue of version. Um, software updates in uh, 10 years ago, you could turn it back like a legacy, go back a year, move mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But right now, we see this um, sort of symbiosis between the software itself and the content producers. Mm -hmm. So, the software updates. Content automatically will be readable because of the software updates and every content that uh, was useful. So Google has this problem. If it's an update, but you can't uh, read the actual content, they can't use the server. So they're obligated basically to update their own, uh, their own software. But this, to me, it seems to cancel out this issue of versions and of updates because if they don't automatically make their own content readable, then they're basically casting you out as a user of the I understand the, the observation you're making, and there is some truth in this. It is possible for the vendors to move too far and too fast yeah. on this. Although I would say there's enough monopolization here that um, the fallback is increasingly lawsuits rather than finding another vendor. Um, when you start looking at how much money um, people have got invested in ebook libraries and things now, um, that actually it's a big sunk investment. Yeah. Um, the other issue is that I think that what you're describing works best in a situation where there's a lot of um, supplier monoculture. Um, if you know you only use Apple products and Apple software, um, they it works together a little more nicely than if you've got five or six vendors represented there. But I think that that becomes um, a real barrier to innovation uh, over time. Um, so. Um, you're right, there are, there are unquestionably some economic limits, and um, you particularly see this, of course, when the, um, the uh, negotiating power is a little more balanced than between individual um, 
individual consumers and um, very large software companies. For example, when you see, you know, the kind of arrangements that Microsoft has to make with very large global corporations, um, uh, they're, they're, you know, very clear about they're concerned with uh, advance notice about um, compatibility and about commitments for support for very long periods of time. You know, Windows XP is just now starting, we're starting to see, you know, the, uh, the end of the line for that. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised to see that extended again. Um, the one other thing, you know, that I would say here too is um, some of the reasons that the vendors want to do this are, you know, really reasons of commercial interest, sell you the latest versions and, and keep revenue streams up. Some of them are, are, are very legitimate reasons as well. You know, as security has become a bigger and bigger problem, the notion of having security updates automatically, you know, load two or three times a day. Um, is very attractive and is very helpful in um, uh, limiting the spread of various kinds of malware. So there are some some reasons why um, this is attractive as well. Yeah. I think we're close to the end of our time. Okay. The canola. The canola. The canola. Okay. Tell us what that is. Well, Noah and the digital ark. Okay. That kept Noah. Fair enough. It has to be concise and you have to know what it means. It's not digital, it's knowledge. Mm -hmm. The knowledge, Noah. Okay. And the ark. Remember what happened when it began. Okay. We will leave on that note. Over to you, sir.